Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. I hope you've been tuning in with your classrooms all month long. February is one of our favorite months. Every February, we kick all the men out, and we host women in science, uh, exploration, conservation, engineering, and more all month long. So I think we've got something in the neighborhood of 45 to 50 live events this month. So if you haven't already uh, spent some time on the website, head over to exploringbytheseat.com. You can find all those free live events available for classrooms, uh, register for camera spots, or to tune in live via YouTube. We'd be happy to set your classroom up. Well, I'm really excited for today's event. Coming all the way from the West Coast, we have marine biologist Sylvia Earle joining us. She's an explorer in residence with the National Geographic Society. She has pioneered research on marine ecosystems with a special focus on exploration, conservation, and the development of new technologies for accessing the deep sea and other remote environments. She is the former chief scientist of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the founder of Mission Blue, which is furthering global initiatives aimed at restoring health and productivity in our ocean, and she has led more than 100 expeditions, logged over 7,000 hours underwater, and earned some super cool nicknames along the way, like her deepness and Sturgeon General. So I'm going to bring Sylvia in live with us right now. Hey, Sylvia, how are you doing today? Doing pretty good. How are you, Joe? I'm good. I'm good. It's always great to steal some of your time and to host you and even better when we get to do it with hundreds and hundreds of students tuning in from all over North America. You might even hear my rooster in the background, Michelangelo. So I sure listen closely. <laughs> I sure hope we do hear Michelangelo. Most times we connect, we do hear him in the background. So uh, let's keep our fingers crossed. All right. Well, Sylvia, it's so great to have you joining us live today. Uh, we've got a great group of classrooms joining us from across North America. We have seven classroom groups on camera with us, uh, and they're going to get to ask some questions. We have even more groups tuning in live via YouTube. Some of them are sending messages already. We've got groups in Toronto, California, Waterloo, New Jersey, Ottawa. So we've got a great group with us. Uh, I'm going to let you take over for a little bit, Sylvia, uh, and share with us. Take us into your blue world, uh, and then we'll do some questions. I really look forward to the to the questions and hearing from all of you out there. I get asked a lot by kids, how did you get to be explorer at National Geographic? How did you get to be a scientist? And I say, well, it was actually pretty easy. You start out as a kid and do what kids do. Do what you do ask questions. It's like, who, what, why, where, when, how? And I think one of my favorite questions is, why not? You have a lot of people you'll find along the way who will say, you can't do that. You mustn't do that. There's no way this is. Un so you ask, why not? And anyway, for me, it was, it was just, a question of finding whatever it took along the way to to enable me to stay close to nature. I started out in New Jersey on a little farm. I used to get down to the beach once in a while. <laughs> the ocean got my attention when I was a little kid, knocked me over <laughs> with a big wave. And my parents decided to move to Florida when I was 12. Then the ocean was my backyard, the Gulf of Mexico. To tell the story, a couple of minutes anyway, with a little video, I, I want to share it with you, Joe, if you'd bring it up. This answers the question about why explore? What motivates anybody to get out there, get wet? Or if you go into deserts, not get wet, but explore, whatever it takes. Joe? When we'd go to the ocean in the summers, the first thing that I, I could sense as we got 
close to the sea, as you could just hear this faint roar of the waves crashing on the beach. And as we got closer, I could smell the ocean. And then finally, we come over the dunes, and I could see the ocean, that great blue-green expanse. And then racing over the dunes, you could jump in and touch the ocean. Well, I can still feel that, that exhilaration. But what has held my interest is life in the ocean, those big horseshoe crabs that crawl up on the beach along the Jersey Shore in the summer. It's the starfish that come ashore once in a while, and then they get washed back into the sea. It's the seaweed and the smell of the ocean. We're explorers are little kids who never grew up. They keep that same sense of, of discovery, that everything is a miracle, and everything truly is. The whole nature of exploration is the unknown. The whole incentive is to peel back the layers of what we don't know. I regard this as the sweet spot in time, because until right about now, we could not see ourselves in perspective in the universe, and we may be the only creatures ever to have the capacity to do that. Now we know that we're changing the nature of nature. Now we know that what we're doing is changing the ocean. Our lives depend on the existence of the ocean. That message has yet to reach all people everywhere. So that's a big challenge. People far inland, many don't realize that with every breath they take, they're connected to the ocean. With every drop of water they drink, they're connected to the ocean. They may not, never touch the ocean, but the ocean touches them. We have a planet blessed with an ocean, and that we don't have all the answers yet. There's still plenty of room for kids to find discoveries that no one in all of the history of humans has seen or understood what any little kid has a chance to go and find out and then tell all their friends to make a difference for the world. Knowing is the key. So how could we not explore the ocean? So there we are. How could we not explore the ocean? So where are we? How much of the ocean has been at least seen by humans? Well, so far, you know, only about 15%, maybe a bit more of the ocean floor has been mapped with the same kind of accuracy that we have for the land or for the moon or Mars or Jupiter. We are pretty good at mapping the skies above and the surface on the land but that other surface, the surface that's below the ocean, we have a general idea of where the big mountains are, where the big broad plains are, but we really don't have the, the detail that is needed to really understand just the nature of the, of the configuration of the bottom of the ocean. But then the real ocean is above the bottom. You know, it's the, apart from the top down to the depths below. The average depth of the ocean is about two and a half miles, four plus kilometers. The maximum has only been visited by about a dozen people. That's seven miles down, uh, 11 kilometers, a little bit, you know, I think there's only one more person who's been to the deepest part of the ocean than have been to the moon gives you an idea of how, how where our priorities have been. It's looking up, looking up. We have to really understand this part of the solar system, this part of the universe, which is our home, the blue planet. The thing about the ocean that I think is, aside from rocks and water, that we need to really embrace and understand and explore is life in the ocean. We have taken a lot out of the ocean in terms of the life. 90% of the sharks are gone, taken largely 
since 1980, which is, you know, not that long ago in terms of the history of humankind. We've really put the pressure on extravagantly found ways and means to extract life out of the ocean on, a, on an industrial scale. We've kind of given up killing whales starting in the 1980s, and they've started to recover somewhat. But tunas, swordfish, you name the creatures that are in our marketplace even today, and certainly the sharks, are really in trouble. And it's changing the chemistry of the ocean. We take all those creatures out of the ocean, it's a living soup. And when you extract major elements of the soup out of the ocean, <laughs> one thing that happens that's a matter of concern that maybe you'll want to think about is how what we take out of the ocean, how that affects planetary climate. You know, changing climate is a big headline these days. And we think about got to protect the trees because they capture carbon dioxide, photosynthesis, generate oxygen, and provide food. They capture the carbon dioxide, turn it into sugar, CO2 plus water, yields food, sugar, and oxygen. Yeah, trees and corn and <laughs> grass and all the vegetation on the land, the photosynthesizers are really important. And we've done a pretty good job of cutting back the old growth, the wild places, so that now globally in my lifetime, I've witnessed a tremendous loss on the land. Most people are not aware of a similar catastrophic loss of ocean systems. Half the coral reefs, about half of the seagrass meadows, the mangroves and other systems, kelp forests are in sharp decline. And you ask why? And you can look in the mirror and see humans are the cause on the land and in the sea. And these ocean systems like those on the land especially the microorganisms, phytoplankton in the sea, forests, microforests, that just as forests on the land, are capturing carbon dioxide out of the air and generating food, sequestering, holding the carbon in the ocean. Ultimately, it goes to the bottom of the ocean. When fish naturally die, whales ultimately come to the end of their life, they sink to the bottom, and all things considered, the ocean is where most of the carbon on the planet is stored, where it eventually goes. It goes into the soil on the land, but it goes deep into the ocean. And when we take wildlife, including whales, out of the ocean, including tunas, cod, and swordfish, and squid, and all the other things that we take from the ocean out of the ocean, the carbon that they hold in their bodies is either released when they decay as carbon dioxide and methane, another important so-called greenhouse gas that is responsible for warming the planet right now, or when we consume those creatures and we burn the energy and exhale carbon dioxide, <laughs> that's the carbon that was in the ocean, goes back into the atmosphere. You know, People say, well, that's pretty nerdy. You're thinking about the carbon cycle and thinking about climate. You're thinking about what humans do when they make choices about what to eat and how we treat the land and the sea. What, 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 how, how can I personally relate to that? Well, everybody personally does relate to that. It's just most people don't think about it. And I hope you, every one of you, we use that capacity that is really special to being not just a human being, but to be a 21st century human being, you, m me, all of us. We have that superpower of knowing what, I, what could not be known before. We did not know what life was like in the deepest part of the ocean or what earth looks like from high in the sky or how to share the view with people all over the world. None of that was 
possible when I was a child, but you know things that even the smartest people who ever lived a century ago could not know. Einstein did not know what Earth looked like from space. Einstein had no idea what life was like in the deepest parts of the ocean because nobody, no human, had been there during his lifetime. But consider your lifetime, how lucky we all are to understand how, what a miracle it is that Earth exists at all in a universe. It doesn't have anything like what we have. There are no elephants on Mars. There are no tuna fish on the moon. You know, we are blessed with a really incredible planet. And we know that it's now in trouble because of us. That's great that we know. Because if you know you've got a problem, there's a chance you can do something about it. So what's stopping us? Actually, nothing is stopping us except our will to hunker down, find out where in this great array of things that exist that we can do. What can you do? What can I do? I, I keep trying, and I hope you will too. And I really look forward to hearing your questions. So well, now's the time. All right, Sylvia. Well, thank you so much for that great share with us today. Thanks for sharing a little bit uh, from your past. And of course, you know, just what we stand to lose. We, we are so lucky to know so much about our planet, but there's still so much for us to explore and to discover, yeah. and we need to have a chance to do that. So Sylvia, before I start introducing classrooms, what I'd like to do uh, while you were sharing with us, I pulled together a little Kahoot quiz. And so we're going to let the students get a little interactive. We'll see how well they were listening today as well. And we'll let them compete against each other uh, to see who comes out in the top spots. So I'm going to share this link right here, kahoot.it. If you're in your classroom, if you head to that link, um, you will have an option for a pin number, which I'm going to share in just a moment. If you're lucky in your classroom and you have one-to-one -one technology, you can join right at your seat. If not, your teacher, uh, he or she can join at the front of the room and you can shout out your answers. So let me share my screen here and let's start our Kahoot quiz. This is going to be fun. Here we go. Um, there we go. It should be coming up now. Yep. Okay. So here is our PIN number. Our PIN number for today is 615-2523. I'm going to give a couple moments here. Oh, yeah. Lots of students starting to join already. Perfect. So we have, I think I put five questions today. Five questions. Uh, there's a couple true and false. There's a couple multiple choice. Uh, each question, you have 20 seconds to get your answer in. Uh, if it's right, you get some points. If you get it in and it's right and you do it quickly, you get even more points. If you put it in really fast but it's wrong, Sorry, we got no points for you. You got to get it right and as quickly as you can if you want those big Kahoot points. So we'll give it another couple moments here. Oh, lots of students. We're up over 100 already, Sylvia. Wow. <laughs> I can see some teachers joining, representing their classrooms. Very, very cool. All right. Maybe I'll give it another 10 seconds and then we'll take the Kahoot live. But it's not slowing down. We've got lots joining us. <laughs> okay. All right, Sylvia, are you ready? Anytime. I'm going to take us live and then uh, we're going to have a chance to see what the students are thinking. So here we go. Three seconds to our first question. Question number one was a little bit about Sylvia's past. So where was the farm Sylvia grew up on? Was it Florida? Was it New Jersey? Idaho? or was it in California? Let's get those answers in nice and quick, get those big points, uh, and then we will find out how we did. Couple more seconds. All right, well, couldn't fool them, Sylvia. The majority of the students went with New Jersey. Uh, really cool, and like you mentioned, New Jersey does have a, a beautiful shoreline and those horseshoe crabs. 
So on our school, our scoreboard, Stewie is in the lead, but it's close. Let's see what happens in our next question. About what percentage of sharks have we lost? And so they say it was about 90%, 60%, 40%, uh, or 10%. I myself, I love every opportunity to get into the water with sharks. Uh, yeah. And it wasn't too, too long ago that I was lucky enough to dive with some great hammerheads in, oh. in Bimini in the Bahamas. And it was just beautiful. Uh, all right. Good job, crew. 90%, about 90% of our large sharks. And that's the scary statistic because as Sylvia mentioned, they're keystone species. They are so important for the health uh, of our ocean. What did that do to our leaderboard? Alex, Alex in Mr. Farley's class has taken the lead. Let's jump into question three, a nice true and false question. There's nothing left to explore and discover. There's nothing left to explore or discover. Is that true uh, or is that false? I hope that everybody's on the right track for this one because um, <laughs> we live on an incredible planet uh, and I think we're just scratching the surface. All right, good job students, absolutely true. We have so much left right here uh, on our own planet to learn, to explore, to discover. What did that do? Alex, Alex is holding on strong to that top spot, but team AP Bio is making a late run. Question four, about how much of the ocean floor has been explored or mapped? Was it 80%, 60%, 30%, or 15%? I was lucky enough a few years ago to be on board Bob Ballard's ship, the Nautilus, and spend a few weeks uh, on board during an expedition. And we got to see some parts of the ocean nobody had ever seen before. It was so cool. 15%, uh, about 15%. That's right. Most students went with that question or that answer. Ava, Ava sneaking in a top spot. This is our final question. Let's see what happens. It's another true and false question. The ocean is resilient. Give it space and it can recover. Let's see what our students are thinking out there on this final question. Last seconds on the clock. All right. Our ocean is very resilient. We've seen marine protected areas set up and we have seen life bounce back in incredible ways. So we know we can do it. Let's see what happened in our podium in third place. Ava holding down third place with five out of five. Alex and Mr. Farley's class holding down that number two. Oh, and team AP Bio sneaks in at the end to take that top spot, all right. Let's come back from that screen share. Let's turn things over to Q&A action. What do you think, Sylvia? They were pretty pretty sharp today. They did well. I love it. You oh. know, the one one thing, that that last question, <clears throat> we can never go back to what was. Some components have been lost in my lifetime. And there's there's real concern that of the million species that are right on the edge, and could be lost or not, depending on what we do or fail to do. A lot of them are out there in the ocean. I was a witness. There's a little seal called the Caribbean monk seal that lived in the Gulf of Mexico when I was a kid. They're all gone, all gone. They used to go as far north as Galveston, Texas, as far south as Brazil. They're gone because of us. We cannot put them back, but we can certainly not lose more. We can make things a lot better than they otherwise would be if we just do business as usual and continue on the track that we're now on. We've got to turn and do better, and that's what we're talking about. We can do better, and the ocean definitely is resilient. We've got the evidence. When you take the pressure off, give the, na give na the ocean, give nature a break, good things happen. So right on. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's start meeting some classrooms. If you're tuning in via YouTube, send your questions in via the chat and I'll keep an eye out for those. But let's bring some students on camera here. Let's uh, 
Where should we start? Let's go to Miss Benoit's crew. They are in Ontario, so joining in Canada. There's some second and third graders. I'm going to pop them in here. Oh, great. Hey, second and third graders. How are we doing? Hi. Good. How are you? Good. Sylvia, thank you so much for this opportunity. You are truly one of my heroes. So we are very thankful um, to be a part of this today. So, thank you. For you. How old were you when you started diving? When did I start diving? Yeah. I started, well, just with a face mask. Anybody can start, you know, when you're three years old, I was diving into the ocean. I didn't even have a face mask. When I got a face mask, it was, I could see things underwater much more clearly. But scuba diving came along when I was a kid. I was a teenager when I first had a chance to try scuba. Um, now it's possible to start much earlier. Uh, I think you can begin as, to learn scuba when you're about 10 years old, even eight years old. So, but don't wait until you're eight years old. Dive in just using a face mask. You can see so much and the ocean is waiting for you. All right. Looks like somebody else is on deck back there. Do you want to get your question in? What's your favorite sea animal? Uh, I love them all, but my favorite has to be like you. We are sea creatures. We are sea creatures. Imagine if there's no ocean, we could not exist. So I think of myself, even though I don't have gills or flippers, I can put flippers on and get back into the ocean. It's like home. All right. Well, Thank great. You. Thank you for those great questions. Let's bring in another one of our camera groups and let's see what they're thinking about. Let's go. Hmm. Let's go to Connecticut this time. We've got some third graders hanging out with Mr. Mayo. Let me bring them in. There they are. Huh. Hey, Connecticut, how we doing? Hello. 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 Okay. How much garbage do you find in the ocean? How could a student help take care of our oceans? Uh, the first thing that I think everyone can do is do everything you can to learn about the ocean. Our superpower is knowing. You can't care if you don't know. And you can see what the problems are. Plastic in the ocean. You can, we can do something about that. I mean, everybody makes choices. Uh, so try to choose ways and means of getting what you want without without plastic wrappings and single-use plastic. Or if you have plastic, it's hard to escape in society today. Make sure that you put, don't let it get into the ocean. Don't throw it away. I mean, put it in a place where recycling is possible responsibly dispose of your trash. But if you can tell stories, get others to know and care about the ocean the way you do, it's sharing the view that we need to get people to, to really understand what problems there are so that they can find their piece of the, of the problem and the solution. People say, I'm just one person, but it takes all of us. Everybody can do something. Kids can write letters. If you have a way with numbers, a way with words, a way with art or music, use that power to celebrate the ocean, to get others to care the way you care. All right, great question. Do we have another one there we can grab quickly? Sure. Yep. From someone? Yep. All right. How many animals have you saved and how many oceans have you saved? <laughs> I'm working on, on trying to protect all of the living world in every way that I can. And you ask, well, how do you do that? By, by trying to inspire protection for individual species like horseshoe crabs they're suffering because people take them to use for bait. They take them to, to catch other creatures. I, and and to, to do what we can to be a voice for 
those who have no voice. I mean, we, we gather to have meetings about protecting the ocean, but nobody from the ocean, there's no whale at the table speaking for itself. We have to speak for them to be their voice, to try to encourage national parks, protected areas on the land and in the ocean. And if you are somewhere where you have a backyard or in your, in your city, your community, is there some way that you can get your town, your community to plant native trees, to plant native, a garden with wildflowers or, or wild trees, the ones that actually naturally belong there. We do a pretty good job of having pretty things that are not necessarily the ones that are native to where we live. But you say, well, how can restoring the land and putting native things on the land help the ocean? Because it all connects. It's one big living system, Earth. There's the land here, the ocean there, but it all comes together as one living system. So you're helping the ocean by protecting what you can, no matter where you live. And to understand working with nature, protecting nature counts. So thank you for that question. Great. All right. And I hear Michelangelo is getting quite vocal oh. out there. <laughs> I told you he's, he, he's listening. Just wants to make himself heard. Very cool. Uh, let's grab a question here from YouTube. Um, this is probably a really hard question. Mrs. Wade's class is tuning in and they want to know what's the most extraordinary thing you've experienced while diving in the ocean? It's probably out there. I'm, I'm working on it, looking for it every time I go in the water. <laughs> but every dive is special because you never know what you're going to see. No, never know who or, or what you're going to find. I, I, I have no special answer because when I, I think about any of the dives thousands of times underwater, there's always something that really delights me because I've never seen it before. I, you see new creatures, new behaviors, finding new species in the ocean is really very easy. You just have to know what to look for. Like the microbes, the little guys that shape the chemistry of the land, the sea, and even us. We have the technology now to be able to <laughs> to check them out with microscopes and other technology. Like we have telescopes to see the heavens above, looking through a microscope to see the universe that's inside us, inside all animals, inside all of the soil, inside the ocean. And it's really exciting to be an explorer on a micro level, as well as to even new species of whales have been found in the last 10 years. These are big animals that haven't been noticed by us before. So I, you know, meeting whales on their own terms for the first time sticks with me to be, you know, I thought I was going into the ocean to look at the whales and it turns out they came out of their way to look at me. And it isn't just the big whales. I've had that happen with little fish that are curious about me. I thought I was there to spy in, on them. <laughs> That's part of the excitement of, of getting inspected by the creatures of the sea who are always curious and want to know who you are at the same time that I want to know who they are. All right. Yeah. I love that answer. And it's, you know, there's just something special going for a walk in the forest or the mountains is great. And sometimes you see, you know, animals, birds, but it's fleeting. When you're in the water, you're surrounded by life. It's, it's a totally different experience. So I hope all of our classrooms, all of our students will put on those masks uh, and get below the water. You know, you're never too young. And I think you're never too old to put on a face mask and go explore the ocean. My mother was 81 when for the first time she put on a face mask. It was in, 
in the Caribbean. Water was clear, the fish were curious. She'd seen plenty of fish in an aquarium and she'd seen some on her plate, although she stopped eating fish once she got to see them on their own terms. It just makes a difference. But she said, why didn't you get me to go in the ocean before? And I thought I'd tried, but I didn't try quite hard enough, I guess. I'm glad she got there and I hope all of you will and that you'll never stop going into the ocean. It's there for you your whole life. All right. We're going to take a little trip to Toronto this time. We've got some grade sevens hanging out with Mr. Farley. How are we doing grade sevens? I like your map in the background. <laughs> when was your last expedition and what is usually the process for them? Could you repeat that for me, please, Joe? I missed the first uh, part of your question. When was your last expedition, and what is usually the process for these underwater explorations? So your your last expedition, Sylvia, and how do how does an expedition come together? Okay. Well, the last time on the under the sea was a very short time ago. I wouldn't call it exactly a, an expedition but it was a, a chance to go to the Galapagos. And I did get to dive and I get did get to high five the uh, Minister of the Environment for Ecuador, who is a diver, obviously. And we were there to celebrate action that the Ecuadorian government has taken to protect along with, well, expand protection of the waters around the Galapagos Island and to join with three other countries, Costa Rica, uh, Colombia, and Panama, along the coast of South America, to give safe passage offshore, a marine swimway, a corridor, where sharks, whales, turtles, tunas, are going to be safeguarded from fishing. Now, it's not a big part of the ocean, but it's bigger than has existed before in that part of the world to give safe passage where fishermen will be, will not be able to go. And it's a step in the right direction. And that came together as a consequence of many people working for many years, trying to find ways and means to encourage governments to use their mighty powers to to not only declare areas protected, but to enforce it, to keep the, the destructive practices away. And this is industrial fishing. It's not the fishing along the coastal areas where, well, even coastal areas, industrial fishing can be a problem. The large scale techniques that use means that are, that, that take everything instead of just taking that which is truly needed for people for sustenance. So the, the next big expedition that I have is back to the Galapagos. It will be in July of this year. And we've been working for quite a while, getting people to come up with a plan. What is it that given two weeks, we have a submarine, we have two boats, we'll be taking photographs, documenting what's there, and to plan an expedition, you first have to figure out where do you want to go, who's going to be involved, what is it that we want to achieve, and how do you plan for the unexpected? Because when you go into the ocean, you, you have a plan, you know what it is you hope to achieve. We want to tag some sharks. We want to take the submarine down to visit some deep kelp forests that are deeper than you can actually get to as a scuba diver. We need a submarine to go into the deeper water where there's still sunlight. So we've got a plan. And there are other things. We want to sample how much plastic is out there. We want to record everything we can. But here's the most exciting part. You never know what you're going to find. And you need to be prepared for the unexpected. And then be prepared to share what you discover with your fellow scientists, your fellow explorers, with kids, with people everywhere. So that's our plan. It's a Mission Blue ex expedition to one of our hope spots in the Galapagos Islands. 
All right. Oh, that's so exciting. I've, I've been able to visit a couple of times. Galapagos are just a, an amazing part of our planet. And that's, that's another if students who are tuning in right now, put that on your list to visit the Galapagos um, and playing with the, the sea lions. You, you're, you're never alone when you're in the water. You've always got company. <laughs> All right, uh, let's grab some high schoolers. We've got some high school oh, so students hanging out with us. How are we doing today? Ms. Gerard's crew. Hi. <laughs> We're um, high school students from Notre Dame. Um, I'm Madeline, and this is the rest of my team over here. So um, I have a few questions for you. Um, what would uh, what was the deepest part that you went to, essentially? Like, what was the deepest part of the ocean? And what was your experience down there? The deepest that I have been so far is in the Nankai trough off the coast of Japan using their big submarine called the Shinkai 6500. And it was just such a beautiful experience. It took several hours to go from the surface down two and a half miles. It's about the same depth as the Titanic. It's the average depth of the ocean. So there's a lot more ocean below two and a half miles, 4.2 kilometers actually. And we all the way down could see that we were not alone. There were three of us in this little submarine and they, we could see when we got below where sunlight penetrates, I asked the pilots, two pilots and I was the observer turn off the lights outside and inside. So we didn't, we, it was dark as we were descending through this, this beautiful sea space. And you could see the little sparkles of light and occasionally a big flash as one of the larger creatures that with bioluminescence would fire off. And usually it was because we touched them and they exploded with blue light. When we got to the bottom, again, turn out the lights. And I had, I had two things that made it possible for me to really enjoy that experience in the dark. One was a low light level camera that could take pictures in not complete darkness, but near darkness. And I had some of these cool night vision goggles. I, I was the chief scientist of NOAA at the time, and I was able to borrow from the, the US uh, military, <laughs> some of these high grade night vision goggles that magnify the light that's there. Curiously, because these night vision goggles were really built for light on the land, where red light is most evident, and, and even a small light in, in the most of, uh, important part of the spectrum is visible with these night vision goggles, but underwater blue light is emitted by these, these creatures. So as good as these night vision goggles were up on the surface, they were okay, but not nearly as good as what I could see with my own eyes. So <laughs> I asked later to see if they could tune the ability to, to receive blue light and that actually now is done for those who want to magnify the power to see blue light underwater, uh, but it wasn't possible. That was in 1991. We've come a long way in our technology just in a few years to enable and enhance our ability to not only see what's underwater, but to hear the sounds that the creatures make. There's so much that we now have available to us that makes the exploration even better. Um, I also have another question. So how can we convince people with more than enough resources? So those who are rich and have the resources to do things, but sometimes choose not to, how do we educate them more about being compassionate about the ocean and what can we do to, you know, help them get involved essentially? Oh, I hope that we find answers to those questions. And my, my response is everything we can do to bring this about. We, we have, for example, 
enough knowledge and enough capability technologically to feed people without relying on taking a hundred million tons of wildlife out of the ocean every year and to destroy ocean systems in the process. Some people rely on ocean life, wildlife for sustenance, but that's a relatively small number out of the hundred million tons that are extracted that are largely for luxury choices or for taking to grind up to provide food for cattle and for chickens and pigs or for farmed fish. You know, it's not the best use of wild animals. It's like grinding up songbirds to feed to the chickens, to grind up wild animals from the sea to feed to chickens. We have to get over that. The fish we have, we regard them as free goods that anybody can go and take them, but they're not free. We all pay the cost to what happens to the ocean. And we have to change our way of thinking and understand to make the choices that will lead us to a, a better place. I think there's reason for hope because there is now, you know, I think an awareness that wild creatures, wildlife, but the biodiversity of life on the land and in the sea, wild places on the land and in the sea really make our existence possible. And if, if we just homogenize and, and cultivate every last inch of land, and, and if we do the same thing to the ocean, take all, I mean, we're down to such a small level on so many creatures and have, have trawled and, and it's like you know tearing up the bottom of the ocean with mining and with trawling you know there's a limit we're, we're right at that point where we have to restore and rewild the ocean and rewild the land so we can can prosper i mean it's when you understand that earth is unique in the universe there's only one earth and we need to take care of it we say those words but then we go happily about doing things that are destructive i really your question how do we get people to change how do we get people to do the flip from taking extracting using the whole world as free goods and respecting what's there i think things like the octopus teacher that film where you saw this guy get into the ocean and see an octopus, not as, a, as something to grab and eat or something that you are afraid of. No, he, he treated that octopus as a, like somebody, like someone, someone, a who, not a what. If we could look at birds, and many people do, or like an owl, <laughs> everyone is different. But get to know that owl. Get to know the creatures. We get to know cats and dogs as individuals, and great, that's, that creates that kind of connection, the empathy for other forms of life, including other humans, of course, to do unto them as you'd like to have them do unto you, to take that, that respect, that, that sense of, 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 of really empathizing with other forms of life could perhaps be a step in the right direction. But it, it goes right up to how do we make policies that regard other forms of life as sacred, not just as products, not just as something to be <laughs> turned into something else that we can use for short-term purposes. I don't know. I'm optimistic because I see it happening with nations committing to protecting 30% of the land, 30% of the ocean, and to increase protection for the diversity of life as a commitment during this decade, by 2030, to scale up our respect for nature. By 2050, you know, let's look at at least half of the world 
where we highly or fully protect, to rewild the forests, to rewild the ocean, to, to really understand, yes, it's because we care about them, like the octopus teacher cared about that octopus, but he, um, it, it's, it's for their sake, but it's in the end for our sake. We are sea creatures. We need to take care of the ocean as if our lives depend on it. Because Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Notre Dame high school students, thank you for those great questions. I, I should not go on so long, but. No, no, it's perfect. We have two more, two more classrooms to visit. All right. Uh, we're going to start with Madame Simon's class. They're hanging out with us. There they are. Hey, everyone. Hi, sorry. Uh, you can come on up. Yeah. Sylvia, we're so excited to talk to you. I've been following you since I was a little girl, so I've kind of spread the joy throughout them. So hopefully you've inspired them as much as you inspired me. So thank you. Hi, I was wondering if you were ever scared to deep sea dive. You no, know, the most I've ever been afraid was on a highway, driving a car with other cars coming my direction. And what keeps us from killing each other by smashing into each other is that we try to learn that, that we want to live and we obey the rules. They stay on their side of the road and I stay on my side. Underwater, I feel really safe. Safe because I, I know the creatures out there really don't want to have me for lunch. <laughs> I don't want to have them for lunch. I respect them and I get, I, I just, I'm not afraid of them. What I'm afraid of, if anything, it's that something could go wrong with my submarine or something could go wrong with my scuba tank. And I have to be prepared for that so that safety, being safe underwater means you know what could go wrong and you get, you get, uh, you're ready for that. And you can fix things even when you're deep in the sea. All right. Great question. And I think every dive, I know every dive I go on, you kind of have those little butterflies at the beginning because you're thinking about, you know, what you're going to be doing and whatnot. But then once you get in the water, everything changes. You're just, yeah. The fear, Joe, isn't it? It's a fear of the unknown. And m most people don't know what to expect. And I yeah, think I think so. Or, or, or just, you know, you, you know, you plan for the dive and, you know, maybe it's a deep one on a wreck or something. So you yeah. always think about the things you have to remember, but then once you're in the water, it's those kind of just fade away. Uh, and you're just, you know what you're doing. You're excited. Yep. Uh, yeah. I Like when I get into a submarine, I do my checks, you know, a, a pilot of a little airplane, you, you check things out and make sure that everything's buttoned up, but I trust the engineers mm -hmm. and if something does go wrong here, here's what you, you practice. So you know what to do Yeah. and drop weights. You can come back up to the surface. Yeah. You can fill your ballast tanks with air that, that you've you let the air escape as you go down, but you put air back in to be able to come back up and, and, and divers, why do you have to train to be a diver? Huh. So if something goes wrong, you can know what to do, but meanwhile, you just relax and enjoy yourself. Yeah. Just know it's going to be cool. Absolutely. We're going to bring in our last classroom group here. They're in Sarnia in Canada, Ontario. All right. Grade seven, eight. How we doing? Hi. Good to see you. Has there been one expedition that you've learned more than another? Oh, was that one expedition she's learned more on than another? Yeah, her, we're wondering her most memorable expedition, if there was something that um, was more informative for them in the long run than others. Well, <laughs> I like to think that the next one is going to be the best one. And then the one after that, and the one after that. So keep exploring. I, I had a, there was a series of expeditions with the National Geographic we called it the Sustainable Seas Expeditions, where for five years with little submarines, we actually went around the coastline of the United States and down into Mexico and 
Belize using the little submarines, training individuals to pilot the little subs to go down and explore what places nobody had ever been before. But you know, my favorite part of that expedition, I did not get to go on myself. It was in Monterey where a teacher was trained to pilot the submarine to be able to go down. The little submarine could go to um, 700 meters below the surface. In his case, he trained or managed to get training for his class. This was a high school class, but they all learned, those who wanted to sign up for this, learned scuba. And on the day that, that he could use the submarine to explore off Monterey, the kids went out and they explored down to 80 feet, 80 feet using scuba. They used techniques to count the fish, to run a, a transect line and count the starfish and other creatures along a certain line. Then the teacher <laughs> in his submarine did the same thing, only he went down to 800 feet. Up there near the surface, there were kelp forests, there were starfish, there were sea otters, there were sea urchins, there were abalone. None of those things were down at 800 feet. It was totally dark. But what the teacher found when he did his transect, when he did his surveys, he found that the place was owned by echinoderms. There were basket starfish and brittle starfish carpeting the sea floor. It was, it was just, you know, 800 feet away it was up here, kelp forest, sea otters, abalone down there. It was the same ocean along a continuous line. And it was so different, but it was all connected. But for me, that told us, told a story that we're so familiar with what's up here and just a few feet away, there are great discoveries to be made and we need to connect those dots, connect the systems. And I'd love to know what's down there at 8,000 feet, because this is right near a deep canyon that does go right off into really deep water. And we think of them as separate places, but no, it's all connected. That's what we have to figure out as we go forward with expeditions into the sea and on the land to make those connections and to see how we fit in and how on our watch we need to quit the destruction and embrace the ocean with much greater care than we have up to the present time. All right. Well, Sylvia, I want to start off with a huge shout out to all the groups who joined us via YouTube and sent in great questions. I want to give a huge shout out to all of our camera classrooms. Let me bring a few of them in. If you guys want to get loud for a moment here, a big yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So good to see everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today and all those great questions. Uh, and Sylvia, I mean, thank you. Thank you for sharing your passion with, with this generation of students with us today and the work you continue to do. Uh, it really is a pleasure to host you and, and have all of these great students with us and to hear all the questions on their mind. Well, I'd like to be able to do the bump with everybody, but you do the bump and then the octopus. <laughs> or it could be the giant squid. That's a good one too. I like that one. Hopefully we see that in some more schools, some more classrooms. Or you could do the giant squid, you know. No. Anyway. Awesome. Well, Sylvia, thank you so much. Uh, say hi to Michelangelo. It was great to hear him make a little cameo. And uh, yeah, we look forward to, to more events and, and more time exploring our oceans together. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, right. Thanks, everyone. We're going to sign off for today.